everybody. We're glad you're here. Thanks for coming and join us on this cold Sunday. I want to make sure that anyone who's new here, if you brave the cold, you came to join us, you have a way to connect. We actually have a connect center, that orange container out there on the plaza. It's a little chilly out there. There's some heaters, some people out there that can get connected with you, that can answer any questions you might have about this place. You can always check out our website as well if you have questions, but we're just really glad you're here. We're excited to get to worship with you. We've got some exciting stuff here this morning, powerful message planned. We're going to thank God for all the things he's done for us, the ways he blesses us. So let's worship, let's sing loud today. Excited you're here. Here we go.
every song must end But you never do So I throw up my hands Praise you again and again So all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah and I know it's not Thank you for allowing us to gather this morning in this place and worshiping you, giving you our praise, giving you our glory, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would just rain down upon everyone in here this morning, that your word would be heard and it would be lived out in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You
You can be seated. Thanks for coming out this morning and battling the cold and the snow. We are glad that you are here. I'd also like to thank all of you that are online this morning watching us, bundled up in front of your fireplaces, wrapped up in blankets with your cups of coffee. That sounds pretty good too. We're just glad that you're here joining us this morning. A couple quick announcements. We're in our last couple of weeks for early bird check-in for winter camp. If you have a middle school, a high school, or a young adult, and you haven't signed up yet, we've had lots of people sign up, but we still have a lot to go. You've got two more weeks to get that early bird discount. Uh, we'll be out in the lobby between services today. We can help you with that process and get you through that. We would love to have your young ones with us in February, first, second, and last week of February. It's an amazing experience. Those of you that had kids go last year, you probably understand that. And it's hard to even express and, and tell you guys what that feels like for those kids to be in that kind of an environment. How many guys have been to a Promise Keepers event? It's, it's kind of like that when you're in a room with 50,000 men all worshiping God. And these young ones are surrounded by kids that are, that are worshiping and praising God. And it's just, that's the kind of kids that I want my little ones around. And it's an amazing experience. And it's watch this, just to see them taken to the next level when they go to something like this. And it's also a great opportunity to invite maybe a friend that doesn't have a relationship with Christ. And it's a way that they can hold the rope and get others and friends close to Jesus. Well, how many people are first time uh, visiting Grace Place today? Anybody out there that's their very first time here? Well, we want to welcome you. You can connect through the uh, Connect Center that's right outside. We'd love to get some information from you and talk to you and give you a free gift. We'd also uh, like to just talk about the, the three different ways that you can give. You can go to graceplace.org and give online. You can also give by texting 84321, or you can give in the giving boxes in the back of the room on the way out. Usually when I'm standing on the stage and I'm talking about offering and tithing, I'm standing in front of an unchurched crowd that has come out to one of our events. And it's really hard to explain to a, a non-believer about giving and tithing. And I try to explain to them that they're, they're not here because the church wants their money. They're here because God wants their heart if he doesn't already have it. So it's so much nicer to stand in front of a, a congregation that understands tithing and understands that it's not our money anyway. So giving that 10% back to the church is just following God's commandments and walking in obedience. Um, you guys are in for a real treat this morning. I would like to welcome to the stage Pastor Hollis. Give him a big round of applause. Good morning. I hope you guys had a happy and wonderful Thanksgiving. It's great to be here with you this morning. And for those of you I haven't had the pleasure to meet and you just heard my name, I am Hollis. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Grace Place. And it is a distinct privilege to be able to bring you teaching from God's word this morning and what he's doing in my life and has done in my life. And as I go this morning, I'm gonna share some of my story. And as I share my story, I just wanna say, so it's not, I'm not sharing it so that you feel bad for me. I'm not sharing it so you feel sorry for me or to bring myself glory. It's all to glorify God and what he's done in my life. Brennan Manning writes, uh, and he has a quote that says that we do God a distinct injustice when he brings healing into our lives and we cover our scars. And so this morning as I share, I'm sharing from a space of honoring and glorifying God. How many of you have heard of string theory? Anyone? A few of you have heard of string theory. So string theory, just to keep it really simple, I'm not a scientist, I'm a pastor, um, but <laughs> string theory, to keep it really simple, suggests at the most fundamental level of all the particles, everything, the most smallest particle would be these one-dimensional strings that vibrate at different frequencies. And these strings come together to form all matter in the universe. These strings come together to form neutrons and protons and all of that stuff, right? And then all of that comes together to create creation, to create the stars, the earth, us, human beings. 
And so as we go along this morning, I want you to have that in mind as thinking of these harmonious threads, each vibration, a divine melody, the voice of God shaping who you are. And so today's message I'm entitling the voice of God, the divine voice of God. See, each of us were created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. And in the beginning, before anything was created, <coughs> before anything came to life, God spoke. And God spoke everything into life, the earth, the sea, the stars, the sun, every plant, every animal. It's his voice that created. And then in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. See, we were created in the image of God. Each of you is an image bearer of God. Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, reemphasizes this. When God created mankind, he made them in the likeness of God. In whose likeness are you made? in God's likeness. He created them male and female, and he blessed them. And he named them mankind when they were created. So each of you is created in the likeness of God. Each of you is his image bearer. So if we want to know what God looks like, we look at one another. We look at each person because each person, each and every one of us is an image bearer of the most high God. And each of us has a reflection of who he is in us. And as I look at this and as I think about this, here's what I really think is cool. So if we go to Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4 through 5, Paul writes, for he chose us for God, chose us. God chose you in him before the creation of the world. So before anything was ever created, before he made the earth, before he separated the land from the sea, he chose you. He chose you before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his, in his sight, in love. So, so he didn't do it out of anything but love. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So before the earth was ever created, before anything was ever created, he thought of you and he smiled and it was his pleasure and it was his delight. And he said, oh, I can't wait for the day you're born. I, I have such good things in store for you and you bring me such pleasure and such delight. See, each of us are created in his image, and when we're born into this world, we're born with what I'm going to call this morning a first story. It's the first story of who we are created to be. So we don't have to become something. God knit us together perfectly in our mother's wombs, and we're born into this world with our first story of God, of, of who God created us to be. It, it's, it's the image of God. We're image bearers of God. And somewhere between one and three in most of our stories, that image begins to get distorted. Here's a picture of, of first story Hollis. <laughs> that dude had some nice hair. <laughs> so that, that's, that's a picture of first story Hollis. But here's the reality. If we read scripture and we live life and we understand and interpret scripture correctly, we know that we're born into a world at war. We know that there is a battle between good and evil. And evil wants nothing more than to mar the face of God. Evil wants nothing more to distort and destroy the goodness and the hope and the joy and the creation and the glory of God. But evil can do nothing to God, so what does he do? 
He comes after the next best thing, his image bearers. He comes after you. He comes after me. And he turns all of his destructive energy towards us. He, and he's cunning, and he's relentless, and he's brazen. And I want you to get this. He is specific. He is specific in each and every one of our stories. See, he doesn't have endless resources that he can throw at us. So he is very specific and particular in each of our stories on how he goes after us. And he spends all of his energy on that particular thing. And we begin to live this second story. Okay, so we have first story who God created us to be, and then we have second story, which is as as the enemy comes against us, as words are spoken over us, words like fat or loser or uh, loner or ugly, all the different words, we, we begin to protect ourselves, and we begin to put on masks and cover up to become who we think the world needs us to be in order to protect ourselves from that that is coming against us. We do this so that we can survive. We build this second story so that we can survive the second story assault that comes against us. And it's all of our, every single one of ours, greatest task to rediscover or perhaps to discover for the first time our first story. And it is hard, and it takes courage, and you will face pain, but it is so, so worth it. For me, um, I grew up on a boarding training and breaking ranch down in Littleton, and growing up, the first part of my childhood, my dad was my hero and I was his sidekick. And that all changed shortly into my young adult, or my young life. Uh, My dad became an alcoholic and he became abusive and I became the target of that abuse. Growing up, that was kind of the story of my life. I I would be the target of his violence. Um, I sustained sexual abuse at the hands of others. And, And for the little boy, he had to figure out how to protect himself. He had to figure out how to keep all of the pain at bay how to keep people away and at a distance from him. So he had to begin to create masks in order to survive his first story. So growing up, I didn't grow up in the church. I didn't grow up believing in God or even knowing who God was. Um, In 2005, actually, was the first time I walked into a church. It was Father's Day. My wife and I came to have breakfast at a place called the Lighthouse Cafe, which is now the Trailhead Cafe. We were located downtown at that point, but I had no idea it was a church, and it turns out Father's Day is on Sunday. And we walked in, and Pastor Clay began teaching, and it was up on the screens that were inside the cafe at that time. I looked at my wife, and I was like, this is a freaking church. That's not the word I used. And we walked out without listening to the message. We have five kids, and so over the course of that week, we had a conversation that sounded like we should take the kids to church, which meant, honey, you should take the kids to church. And I'll never forget, she took the kids that next Sunday, and she came home, and she told me about the service, and in that service, Pastor Clay had told a joke, and based on that, and the fact that he was dressed like a normal human being, I was like, I could try this place out. See, my paradigm of Christians was they were not normal, and pastors definitely are not normal. (laughs) <laughs> and so that next week I came and, and I continued to come and, and as God would have it, Pastor Clay began teaching verse by verse through the book of John. And if you want to get to know who Jesus is, the book of John is the place to go. And through that summer, I got to know who Jesus was. And in September of 2005, Pastor Clay was teaching through John chapter 8, Jesus is the light. And during that sermon, he used a sermon illustration video which was two guys talking in the dark, and there was a door opening to the light. And we're sitting in the auditorium, it's pitch black, and one dude's trying to convince the other guy to stay in the dark, and he's like, it's comfortable here. You know it here. People change when they go there. Don't go there. And what I couldn't articulate then, but can now, is Holy Spirit broke down everything in me at that point. 
And it was in that moment I said yes to Jesus. I, I don't know what this all means. I don't know what it looks like, Jesus. But I submit and I surrender to you to be obedient to whatever you call me to. I was a mess. I had tears running out of my eyes, snot running out of my nose. I hadn't cried in front of anybody since I was a young man. And I walked out of that service and walked up to Pastor Clay and I said, what next? Of course, I'm not a little dude. So he's looking at this guy who's a hot mess and he's like, what do you mean what next? And I'm like, what? I just gave my life to Jesus, man. What next? And from that moment on, God has put me at the feet of men and women who are spiritual giants who have been guides, who have been Sherpas with me along my faith journey. And I've been immensely blessed through that. So fast forward 2008, um, I was in construction, 21 years in construction, building custom homes, light family, uh, light multifamily and light commercial. Light commercial. Um, 2008, the market crashed and we crashed with it and literally lost everything. Lost our house, houseboat on Lake Powell, lost our cars. Lost everything. I thought I lost my identity in that season. And through that season, God was so good. Um, I would spend time with him each and every day. And one of my subcontractors, who was my subcontractors and also went to Grace Place, he started doing this MLM, multi-level marketing thing. And so he was trying to get me to join with him in it. And so I was using him for relationships, so he would come over and he'd hang out with me during the day. Um, He'd share a little bit about the business, but then we'd spend most of the time just talking, talking about God, talking about all the cool things that God has done in our lives. And at one point he said to me, he said, he said, Hollis, are you in or are you out? And I was like, dude, I'm out. He said, why? And I said, I want to do something I'm passionate about. He said, well, what are you passionate about? Nobody had ever asked me that question before. I said, "I'm, I'm passionate about cooking. And so, as God would have it, um, just earlier that week, he had met with Jamie and Tiffany. Uh, Tiffany used to be our cafe manager and said, hey, um, turns out they're getting ready to start this catering business, um, and I think they need help, and I also think she needs help in the cafe. So I set up an interview, and I went down, and I sat down across the table from Tiffany, and I just immediately started crying. I have no idea what the heck came over me. I wouldn't recommend this in a job interview. (laughs) but it worked for me. (laughs) Uh, So having no experience in a kitchen, I convinced her to hire me for free. So for six months, um, I worked for free in the cafe. And at the end of that six months, they made me the assistant manager. And, And that season was a really rich and beautiful season in my life because really being behind the register, it was like my pulpit. I would pray with people at the register. Um, I got to meet and engage with so many different amazing people and share the good news of who Jesus was or is. And so through that season then, <clears throat> um, the, one of the pastors, some of the pastors on staff asked me to lead out uh, the ministry to men. And I was like, peace out, there is no way in heck that that is happening. Um, Because growing up, my paradigm for men was they were not to be trusted. Men are not safe. If you get close to a man, you're going to get hurt. And so I don't have any real relationships from when I was a kid or when I was a young man um, with men because I did everything I could to keep them at bay. And so uh, they keep pursuing me. I keep saying, telling them no. And one night I get a phone call from one of the pastors, he's like, hey, we're going to Maryland to look at this ministry model and there's a retreat happening there. Will you please go? And I'm like, no. And he's like, why not? And so I had given all the other excuses, so I've, I came up with the dumbest excuse I could possibly come up with. Don't ever use this if a pastor calls you. I said, I don't have the money. <laughs> he's like, cool, we got that handled. So I just painted myself into a box. I'm like, ah, oh, crap, now I gotta go to this thing. So he says, I'm going to send you a link um, in the morning, go online and register and send me all this stuff so that we can get your plane ticket all taken care of and everything else. And so the next morning I get the email and I open up the email, click on the link, and the link is to this registration for a Wild at Heart boot camp. And I'm just blown away. I'm, I, I call my wife and I'm crying and this is probably the first, or actually not the first, as many times my wife, God bless you so patient with me. She's like, what in the world is going on with you? I'm crying. I'm like, you're not going to believe what God's done. And uh, so anyway, (coughs) um, sign up for this this boot camp. And the reason why it was so significant for me is when I got baptized, a friend of mine had given me the book Wild at Heart. And when I read that book, it, it just 
awakened something in me. It's the pursuit of the heart that God had put into you, into each of us. And I remember journaling, it would be so cool if John could come up, I knew he lived in Colorado Springs, John Eldridge, could come up and speak to the men at Grace Place, having no idea that he did any kind of retreat or anything. And so, so anyway, I fly to Maryland, we get, we get off the plane, go to the retreat center, and the first session starts, and it's video. I'm like, what in the world? I just got Jesus juked, man. <laughs> but it, it didn't last long. And that weekend, I'm telling you right now, is one of the most significant um, shaping weekends of my walk and my journey with God. I've done almost 30 of these weekends now, both here in Maryland and Germany, and I've seen over a thousand men have their lives radically transformed through this weekend. It's not the teaching, teaching's good, but it's an encounter with God. And it was after one of the sessions <clears throat> that I went out to spend time alone with God, and God brought a story to mind. Um, I was about 15 years old, and um, I was home from school. Um, my dad was home early for some reason, and we had gotten into an argument. I don't know what the argument was about, but I turned away from him and began to walk down the stairs to the basement. And the one thing you never did to my dad was turn your back on him. And about halfway down the stairs, there's a shove that sends me toppling down the stairs, and I land at the bottom landing, and my dad jumps on top of me, his knee in my gut and his hand on my throat with what I perceived at the time to be just so much hatred towards me. I extricated myself from that, um, got on my motorcycle, and I drove out to this irrigation ditch and sat under a tree, and it was my place. It was a place where I could go, where I could beat the little boy back into submission, stuff him back in the box, let nobody see him vulnerable or cry. And in that space, I cried out to God to take me away, which was funny because I didn't know who God was but I knew enough to cry out to him. And of course, he didn't take, come and take me away. And so at this time, I was very much into J.R. Tolkien, The Hobbit, The Fellowship of the Ring, and so I cried out to the elves. And to this day, I will always remember this. I will remember this for the rest of my life. For somebody who doesn't know who Jesus is, if you don't know who Jesus is, I acknowledge that the elves are just as real to you as Jesus. Whatever you're looking for, seeking for to fill that hole, I recognize and realize there's many things out there that can have the allure, that can feel just as real to fill that aching hole in your heart, for somebody to come and rescue you. I will never forget that. But I cried out to them and they didn't come. And so God brings all this story to me and says, you need to forgive me. Not that he needs my forgiveness, but that he knew that I needed to forgive him to release the anger and the pain inside. And that whole weekend was this paradigm shift of knowing God as Father in my heart, or in my head, to my heart. See, God as Father in my head, I understood loving, caring, and kind, but God in my heart, what I understood of Father was angry, checked out, abusive, a lot of foul words that I would use there. And it was in that weekend that God recovered a piece of my heart and restored a piece of my first story of me understanding myself as beloved son, his beloved son. And I just want to let you know today, um, we are just opening our registration. We, we don't call it boot camp. We call it expedition. Um, so the expedition registration opens today where it's happening at the end of February. So guys, if you want to sign up for that, I'm, I'm telling you right now, this isn't a marketing ploy or anything, but we do limit how many guys can go, um, not because we want to exclude anybody, but because we want to preserve the experience for you. Uh, and like I said, I've seen thousands of men be radically transformed by this weekend. And so women, if you're looking for something to get your husband, your son, your boyfriend, whatever, this is a, a great gift to get them for Christmas. So fast forward to this year. Um, so I don't know about you, but um, for me, um, it's the pain. It's the places of pain that I really bend my knee and hear God's voice. Um, for those of you who've been around, you know that at the end of last year, I was um, 
I have malignant melanoma uh, cancer. Um, I've had two surgeries, um, and it's fine. So as the doctor said, it's good until it's not. So I'm living until it's not. Um, and so, so I had that happen this year. We've had some really tough and significant things happen as a church this year um, that has been really hard on our staff and our leadership. Um, and it's part of my role is I have to lead through that with others. But as part of that, I've had a lot of really nasty, hard things said about me that are completely untrue. I've had people who I have loved and cared for for 20 years um, who won't even talk to me, who won't look me in the eye. Um, they'll have conversations with other people, but they won't have conversations with me. And it speaks into the deepest place, places of wounding in my heart. It's very specific how the enemy has come after me. And I began to realize that there was this anger, this anger of this old man, the man I used to be stirring inside of me. And so um, if you've been here, we've just finished verse by verse through Romans chapter eight. And at our men's tables, we were soaping through Romans chapter eight. And it was the day that we soaped that, that I was really convicted uh, in that God was reminding me that I don't want to become the man I used to be that I don't want to go back to that. And so um, I, I spent a lot of time in prayer and journaling, and, and my table is absolutely amazing. If you're not at a table, I would strongly encourage you, but, but God's been bringing some amazing men to my table. And most of these men are in some stage of recovery and some stage of wanting to recover from alcohol or drugs or whatever the case may be. Um, and it, in that space, God said to me, he reminded me of a story, and it was a story of a woman who was, uh, her son ate a lot of sugar, and so she made a four-day walk to go and see Gandhi. And she asked Gandhi, hey, will you tell my kid to stop eating sugar? And Gandhi said, come back next month. So she made the four-day walk home. The next month, she comes back, four days there. Will you tell my kid to stop eating sugar? Gandhi says, come back next month. Four days back. Next month, four days there. She's exasperated, she's frustrated, she doesn't know what to do, and she goes to Gandhi and says, will you tell my kid to stop eating sugar? And he looked at the boy and he said, stop eating sugar. And she's like, why didn't you tell him that the first time? And he said, first, I had to stop eating sugar. And God brought that story to me as I soaped on Romans chapter eight and convicted me, not that I have a problem with alcohol, but that alcohol was diminishing my ministry. And so it was at that moment that I said, I'm, I'm done drinking. So, so I quit drinking and began pursuing God in the places of pain. And, and one week I shared that I had quit drinking at the table um, as a way of accountability, but as a way of encouraging other men to link arms with me and linking arms with them and their story. And in, in that morning, two other guys said, hey, I'm going to do that. Beautiful how God works. See, we confess our sins to God for forgiveness, but we confess our sins to one another for healing. And we come together in community to link arms with one another. And it's always beautiful for me to be able to see how God continues to restore this relationship, the beauty of relationship of a man with another man, of men and men, and women and women, but in my story of men with other men and the beauty of the connection in those relationships. Also this year I started a certificate program in getting certified in Restory Counseling. Um, it's something that I wanted to do so that I could be able to bring that back to our table leaders and invest in them so that they can tend to the men and women at their tables well. Um, and also just for me to journey, continue my journey. As part of that, we have cohorts where there's four people. There's three of us who are in the class and one who is a licensed Restory counselor. And so in it, you do counseling. You're a counselor and a counselee and the, the other two observe and then you get feedback. So after one of the sessions, um, and you bring a story that you've done work in. So I, I, I brought this story of the stairs that I just shared with you to this. And so after one of the sessions, um, the counselor gives the feedback to the person who was doing the, the counseling. She says, hey, you left the boy alone at the bottom of the stairs once again, because uh, she took me to the ditch, um, to that space, but avoided the bottom of the stairs. 
And so the next time that she was doing the counseling with me, she's like, where do you want to start? And I was like, well, let's start at the bottom of the stairs, having no idea what I was asking for at that point. And uh, that moment was really significant for me. And it opened up the space of realizing this deep agreement that I have that I'm alone and that I'm a screw up and that's not the word that I use. I'm keeping it G-rated right now. But I just want you to know there's a, a different word that I use when I speak deep inside. Alone and a screw up. And I began pulling on that thread all that night. And the, the more I pulled on it, the more tangled that thread got. And I was trying to figure out, how do I undo this? How do I get out of this deep vow, this, this bind? And that week, later that week, myself and a couple of men um, went to what is a Grove training retreat. So I took a couple men from our brotherhood leadership down to this Grove training retreat. And as part of that, um, for me, I'm, I was second year in this. They were first year, but... Um, for me, as, as part of that, what I had to do is I had to send ahead a picture uh, of me in, uh, as a little boy, which was difficult and challenging to find, but I found one and I sent it ahead. And so um, the first part of this training was to paint a mask. And, and so the task was to paint a mask that, of what you put on for the world to see. And so I painted a mask. So bright yellow cheery, cheerful if you know me. That's kind of how you would encounter me. Red smiley face, rosy cheeks, a little fire up here. I'm a little fiery adventure. But there's also these black hard lines under the eyes and under the mouth because I can be very hard. And both of these are a mask that I put on to keep you away, to keep people away. If you get too close, I will put on a mask of joy, and if that doesn't work, I will put a mask on of fierceness. Because I don't want you to get too close to see, because if you see, you'll run. So the second part of this task, so then we paint the mask, we come together, we talk about it. Then the next part was to paint the inside. What does the mask cover? So go and paint the mask. And so for me, what the mask covers is alone, screw up, again, another word in there, and this chaotic darkness, hopelessness, a, a mouth screaming with an X through it and red tears, silent screams of pain that can never come out. And this undid me realizing this space of brokenness that's inside of me, realizing this space of woundedness that's inside of me. And one of the words that my counselor said was, who would come for a screw up? And if you talk to me as a pastor, no matter what you've done, I will tell you Jesus will come for you. And I believe that to the bottom of my heart. But what I realized that I don't believe is that Jesus will come for this guy. What I don't believe is that Jesus would come for me, for the brokenness, for the broken little boy inside of me. The third part of this exercise then was to stand in a circle and they handed out the pictures that you had sent. This is a picture that I sent. And they said, this is your first story. It's really hard for me to look at this picture because this mask is firmly in place on this little boy. This little boy is already firmly deep into second story, covering up the pain 
covering up the wounds. And here's the thing. When we take on wounds, we can cover them up and we can make them look pretty. We can put masks on. But what happens is underneath that bandage, it begins to get infected. It begins to affect the skin around it. And then it begins to go deep. And it will go deep into our bloodstream. Sepsis sets in and it begins to affect every single part of our body. Sometimes you have to amputate a limb in order to get rid of the infection. Or we armor up. Think of Darth Vader. Hard, cold, outside. Tough. You, you name all of the things when you think of Darth Vader. But you take off the mask. You uncover inside as a human being who is broken, whose body is marred and wounded. So we can either cover it up and make it look pretty, or we can cover it up and power up. And so what I realized in this weekend was that I had done work from 15 on. I have a picture of me at 15. So I'd done work from this point on, but I hadn't done any work from that point back. And as I was pulling on those threads, I realized that the tangled mess that I was encountering, I needed help to navigate. The spaces of anger and hurt and pain that were welling up inside, I needed help to navigate. And so I signed up for counseling um, and, and have begun counseling. And I, I began to realize all of the different areas that this has affected my life, how these agreements have affected my life. So being a screw-up, having that deep agreement, my number one thing is to not be a screw-up, and I will do everything at the detriment to my health, at the detriment to my family, at the detriment to my relationships to make sure that I am not a screw-up. I will work myself to death so that you will see I am not a screw-up. That's just one example of how it plays out in my life. And being alone, then I live in this chaotic space of wanting and desiring relationship and pulling, drawing people in, but yet when they get close, close enough to be able to possibly see, I, then I repel. And so it's this chaotic space of, of knowing and needing and wanting and hungering and desiring relationship, but yet so much fear that I push it away. But God in his goodness... God in his love, God in his kindness, and God in his tenderness, which doesn't feel really freaking tender right now, will not leave me there. And he will not leave you there. He wants more for you. See, the work of Jesus on the cross was to restore the first story. The work of Jesus on the cross coming, living a perfect life, living a sinless life, going to the cross for each and every one of us, for each and every one of our sins. He goes to the cross, he's strung up on the cross, and he dies there. And if it ended there, it would all end. But it didn't. He was buried in a tomb, and three days later rose again, which means he was who he said he was, which means he could do what he came to do, which was the forgiveness of sins. And if you have not accepted Jesus into your life, I implore you to do that today. It is the best decision you will ever make. But that is not all. I believe that the enemy, one of the biggest spaces of the enemy that he especially does in the Christian community is he says, yes, Jesus came to die for your sins. Live this life, this comfortable, placid life. No, Jesus came to restore that which was lost. Jesus came to restore you to your rightful place as sons and daughters of the Most High God. Jesus came so that you would bring the kingdom of God into every place that you go. Amen. Jesus came so that you would recover your first story, so that you would no longer live with the masks on. He came, yes, for the pain. He came, yes, for the sin. 
but he came to take this all away, that you would live your first story, that you would live the life that God created you to live. It's that that we live into. It was God's divine voice that created creation. It was the enemy's voice that broke creation. And the cross is God's divine voice restoring his people to him. The cross is God's divine voice echoing throughout eternity to bring you back home, to bring you home to your second story or your first story, to release you into more. I have come to seek and save the lost and set the captive free. Many of us don't live in that freedom. Many of us are afraid to pursue the wounds, the hurts, the pain that we have felt in this life in order to eradicate it. See, we got to go in and we got to clean out the wound. Yes, it's painful. Yes, it's hard, but it is worth it. Because it is only then, then and only then, that God can do his healing work. That God can restore. And he wants that for each and every one of you. To close, I want to land on this. I want to put up Numbers chapter 24 through 26. So this is called the priestly blessing. So these words are God's words. They are not man's words. These words were given directly by God to Moses to give to Aaron to speak to his people. And not as a people broad, but as individuals, as individual people. There's five things I want you to see here. First, God is the source of all blessing. Six times in these verses, he says you. He doesn't say all of you. He says you. It's very specific. He says you. He's not, it doesn't say will you. It doesn't say may you. God has proclaimed his blessing over you. He blesses you personally. This blessing blesses you personally. When God spoke these words, he thought of you. And he blesses you personally. When we look at this, blessing in the Hebrew word means to kneel down. So metaphorically, God kneels down to you. He, he brings his face close to you. And, and keeping you it's all of his benefits, his faithfulness, his mercy, his forgiveness, his grace, his love, his comfort, his restoration, his adoption, and so much more. The Lord keep you. God blesses us as a father does his child. It says to make his face shine upon you. It's as the father bends down and lifts the child face to face, his face beaming at you, <laughs> delighting in you as his beloved son, as his beloved daughter. And God's blessing brings peace. May it bring you peace. And here's the key with this. This word peace does not do justice in this. Because the Hebrew word is shalom. And the word shalom means to restore to original. It means to restore to that which was. So when God says bring you peace, he wants to restore you back to the original, the first story of who God created you to be. I want to ask you to stand. The Lord's blessing is to bring you completeness to wholeness in your first story. 
So as his people, I want you to think about this string theory that I talked about. I'm not building a theology on this, but the reverberation of God's voice from the beginning to the end, the reverberation of those strings vibrating within you, the reverberation of God's voice when he spoke this blessing, and as we speak it over you, I want that to reverberate deep into your soul, deep into the very fabric of your being, not my voice, but God's voice. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be gracious to you and make his face shine upon you and bring you peace. Pastor Jeremy said once, when it comes to music, that it invades our souls. And I pray this morning that this song would invade your soul.
and your children and their children and their children may his fame be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his fame be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children declare now may his presence come before you and behind you and beside you all around with all of you. So good to sing it over you and with you over each other. So blessed to be with all of you in this place today. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming out to worship with us. I want to make sure you know we got our Christmas kickoff coming up December 1st. It's going to be super fun. It's one of our biggest things we do each year. We're super excited to kick off Christmas together, celebrate the season, have fun with community and family. It's going to be awesome. So make sure you Mark your calendars for that, invite a friend. We also have some opportunities to serve at that event if you're passionate about helping our community to connect. We have a lot of setup, a lot of um, things that go into that event to prepare for it to make it awesome. So if that's something you're interested in or if you just want to know more details, you can go on our website, graceplace.org slash events. All right, we also have our prayer team in the back if you need anyone to pray with you over you. In addition to what we've already done, we've sung over you together. Now we get some people to pray with you as well if you need that. Otherwise, we love you. Go in peace. Have a great week.